Brace yourself. Welcome to Fringe Element here on the 440 Sports Network. My name is Braden Gall, and you can follow me on Twitter at Braden Gall. Who goes next, me? Yeah, you. Mine's Aaron du- the Aaron Dugan on Twitter, Aaron underscore Dugan on Instagram. Your name is the Aaron Dugan. We have a we have a never too early, way too early preseason rankings roundtable for you folks today on the show with two people that I could not be happier to discuss rankings with. And in the red corner, we have a- St- Stephen Lassen representing Athlon Sports preseason way too early top 25. It's already on websites now. Of course, check that out. Athlonsports.com. Stephen, how are you? I'm doing great. It's always good to be here, Braden, with you and Aaron. And my good friend, Michael Bratton. You can also follow me on Twitter at Athlon Steven and check out all my work at AthlonSports.com. He did the introduction for me, Michael, of course, that SEC podcast in the blue corner, Michael Bratton joining us as well. So we've got a whole host of people here. Everybody's got power rankings. Michael, how are you? Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me. Always, uh, you know, up to talk some SEC football, even though it's the middle of January and I think most non-crazy SEC fans are not even thinking about next season, but people like us certainly are. So I'm ready to talk about it. (laughs) Yeah, we don't like those people. (laughs) We're not friends with those people who watch the college basketball. Um, All right, so we're going to go 1-14. to We all have different rankings, of course, so we're going to work through all of our problems. It's going to be like a big family gathering here, uh, except for no booze and no crazy uncle. So it's going to be fun. Uh, obviously rate review subscribe to the show share the product make sure you're checking out steven's youtube page obviously listening to michael's show as well you guys check all that stuff it'll be listed in the show notes so make sure you're perusing all that great stuff uh, that we have that those guys have to offer aaron of course before we do that however fringe element is brought to you by our wonderful and amazing friends at je dunn that, the world's is- leader yeah. in employment do they have more people than everybody or are they just the best they're just the best for? No, no, no. They're quality, not necessarily quantity. I it's don't pretty believe. big, though. It's pretty big. Five billion in annual revenue. You know, offices all across the country. Over two hundred job openings. Uh, it is a top one hundred healthiest place to work in the United States. Um, I don't know what else you could want. They got two big green eggs on the Nashville office, which I've told you guys before. They have a like a video game station, like in the office. You go play video games and listen to like vinyl records yeah, it's and shit. It's great. wild. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good little setup. Jedun.com is the website right there on the top. Uh, click on the tab careers and uh, just peruse what they've got. They've got something for you if you're looking to be fulfilled. Uh, if you want a career and a job in which your employer cares as much about you as you do, which doesn't exist very often in this great, wonderful, and amazing country we have, go check out Jedun, Jedun.com. All right. Bills are paid, boys and girls, ladies and gents. All right, we're going to start with Athlon Sports in the red corner. <laughs> we, we're going to agree on a few things today, and I have a feeling this is where we're going to start. So number one, we're going power rankings, entering basically spring practice as rosters sit and as they are constructed today at time of taping on Tuesday, January 17th. Steven Lassen, who is the number one team in the SEC? This is a hard one, Steven. This is a hard one. Brace yourself. It's Georgia. Um, I wish I could give you a more interesting answer, but certainly there are some personnel losses with Stetson Bennett, uh, Jalen Carter, Keely Ringo, offensive line's going to have a few new faces. But Georgia's got the best you know, combination of talent, coaching, schedule next year. I think they are a very easy number one pick. And frankly, this is the spot that we would give Alabama in previous years. I just think it's interesting now that, hey, we're giving that same treatment to Georgia. They've certainly earned it. Michael, what you got? Are you agree, disagree? Georgia Missouri. Bulldogs overrated? <laughs> number number one Missouri Tigers. Oh, he tricked us. He tricked no, us. No, of course. I mean, I, you can't do a list like this. It's not legitimate if you don't have Georgia. And I'm trying not to base this on what just happened. But, I mean, just a clobbering of TCU in the national championship game. What a performance. And I don't think they're slowing down anytime soon. We, we doubted Stetson, or at least I did, doubted Stetson Bennett for two years in a row. So naturally, they're going to upgrade at the quarterback position. I don't know if that's really the case anymore. He was so clutch. But if I was saying that for two years, I have to say they're going to upgrade with all these five-star quarterbacks that they got. As long as they don't lose Todd Munkin, which is kind of like a a popular rumor now to the NFL, still, even if they do, I would put Georgia number one for now. But at least that way, I could see a path to someone possibly upsetting Georgia next season. I do not have anything else 
more or a more interesting answer than either of those two. I think this is kind of unanimous from us and it's, it's just hard for it not to be. Um, although Georgia does have some losses coming up, you know, going into this next season, I think that, you know, kind of like you guys mentioned, there's still some very valuable tools in place, including Brock Bowers, which, you know, just will give whoever takes that quarterback position, which it's looking like it's going to be Carson Beck, um, give him some room to explore and an accurate target like that, you know, uh, actually develops a core. Is, it enables a quarterback to develop faster. So I do think having some of those um, upperclassmen back will will help. Uh, Steven, give me the first name of all the lax bros competing for the starting Georgia quarterback job. There's so many lax bros. Yeah, that's right. Carson, Gunner, and Brock. Um, <laughs> with, you, with Stetson leaving. <laughs> yeah, with Stetson leaving. You know, I, I think as others have put it here, I mean, Carson <laughs> Beck is the front runner to be the starter next year. And you could argue, frankly, that they're upgrading in terms of talent. You look at where Stockton and Vandegrift have, have ranked in recruiting, and certainly Carson Beck uh, is no slouch in that department as well. So it will be interesting, I, I think, to see, uh, you know, high, higher level of talent taking over a quarterback. I also think they upgraded at receiver. They brought in Ra Ra Thomas from Mississippi State, Dominic yeah. Lovett from Missouri. You could argue they have better receiving core going into next season. Um, and, and as Mike mentioned, I think keeping Todd Monken is the most important thing uh, for Georgia going into next year. That could be one thing that derails their title hopes. Stetson, Gunner, Carson, and Brock. It could not John, be more basic. Johns Hopkins lacrosse team starting at quarterback for Georgia Bulldogs next year. Um, listen, I, I, I think the Alabama comment is interesting. Because if not for one of the craziest, and we talked about this on every episode of every show we've ever done, but like if not for one crazy <laughs> decision by Nick Saban, they have three national titles right now in the last six years, and we wouldn't even be having a conversation about which team is the best program in college football. It, it is, it's not even close. It's the Georgia Bulldogs right now. Now, this is where things are going to get interesting. Oh, wait, because... I've got a hot take real quick. Oh, let's hear it. Let's hear I'm, it. No, I'm known for my hot takes. I don't, I, I'm not going to lie and say that I watch a ton of high school football, but a couple of years ago, Gunnar Stockton, Brock Vandergriff, those are the two five stars on Georgia's roster. They went head to head. Gunnar Stockton, even a year younger than Brock Vandergriff. And just, I'm solely basing it on that one game because, again, I'm not going to lie. I, I don't sit here and watch high school football all day. But Gunnar Stockton looked like the next edition of Tim Tebow. So just imagine if he is oh that God. good and he's the starting quarterback for the Georgia Bulldogs next season. I mean, it, it would be incredible. Well, the the three peat is is on un, is unprecedented, really. I mean, e when's even the last time it happened? You know, uh, like Army, maybe. <laughs> I, <laughs> Think like, of I, I don't know. Pre integration, pre integration, <laughs> pre pre World War Two, pre integration. I don't know, but like, uh, the, you know, I don't. I think I don't 30s. think I don't think Bama or Oklahoma had one in the seventies or or in the, with Bud Wilkinson or or Bear. I don't think they did, but I know. Os no, I know it. <laughs> yeah, Osborne had three out of four. In, in the nineties with Nebraska, but that's, which is pretty un unbelievable. But um, I, so here's where we're going to disagree though, because three of us have Alabama at number two in the sec, Michael, you have LSU. So we're going to lead with you here. LSU better than Alabama legitimate discussion between these two in the off season. So I don't think it's a hot take or anything, but explain yourself why you've got LSU at number two ahead of Alabama. And can you trust LSU ever? <laughs> I don't think I'm the one that has to explain myself. I think it's the rest of you. I mean, what what are we basing this off of? The the best quarterback in school history gone. Arguably the best defensive player, at least of the modern era, gone. Both coordinators, Bill O'Brien, you know, he's probably hours, days away from getting fired, letting go, whatever you want to call it. Alabama's fingers are crossed. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't get it done on this revenge tour. I mean, it looked like, uh, you know, another rebuild down there in Alabama. I mean, I mean, there was time and time. They nearly lost to Texas. Did Texas even finish ranked? And this was Texas without their starting quarterback. Uh, they should have lost to Texas A&M, but Jimbo Fisher doesn't know how to call a play, and Haynes King does not know how to throw a pass on the goal line. Otherwise, they'd have another loss there. If you're saying Alabama's number two in the country, number two in the SEC, you're basing that. I don't know what the hell you're basing it on because you're not basing it on what I just saw. And that's what I have to go on is what we just saw last season. This is Saban's on the decline. He's been on the decline and, and they think getting rid of Pete Golding is going to fix the defense. Well, that's asinine because he is the mastermind down there. And 
as soon as Kirby left, as soon as Jeremy Pruitt left, the, the defenses went on a tailspin. So I think the the defensive issues square are are, are squarely on Nick Saban's shoulders. I don't care who they are. I mean, how often do we see Alabama dip down for more than not very long, though? AP history teacher would drill it into your head that history repeats itself. Well, I do think there is something to say. I'm not that LSU hasn't done it recently because they have, but it's still it's just it's hard to count Alabama out because of the systems they have in place have worked so well for so long. And I think it's not about what we just saw. It's about what it's going to be. And that is what's so difficult about college football in the modern era with the portal and all the new rules is we know less about these rosters heading into summer camp than we ever will in the history of the game because there's so much newness across the board. But I think coaching staff changes. I, I agree with, with Bryce Young. They also, through all of that adversity and through all those problems, were also two plays away from being 12-0. and 0. So you got if you're going to say all that stuff, you have to come back and also say if if, if, if Jason Taylor's kid drops a pass, they win the West and they're playing in the SEC championship game. And so we've, we've, you kind of have to play that one both ways. I think they're better at wide receiver. I think they're better along the offensive line. I think the running game will be okay. I think that they're, whoever they hire is going to be an upgrade on Bill O'Brien. I think whoever they hire is going to be an upgrade on Pete Golding. They've got to replace some, some safeties and some front seven guys. But I, I think the defense will be as good. And LSU's losing two or three of its best players as well. So I, I just... I, I think they're pretty close. I think they're pretty close. I lean stability, track record, Alabama depth, talent, building the roster. Brian Kelly's really great. That's where I would lean that way, Stephen, if, if I had to go Alabama. It's really close. Um, I wrestled with this one. I, I think I, I kind of defaulted almost to Alabama at two over LSU, largely just because of you know recent history. Like they've like we talked about just a few minutes ago, they've been the easy team to pencil in at number one. And when you start looking ahead to this season, I, I think to to kind of play devil's advocate at the same time, I think everything you said about Alabama is certainly true, but they needed a lot of Bryce Young bailouts over the last two years just to get in those positions. So now that he's gone, who steps up at quarterback? Um, You mentioned the offensive line. There is some turnover. There's turnover in the secondary. I think one thing, if we're thinking ahead, is that the game is in Tuscaloosa and you give Nick Saban a couple months to get ready for this game, by then Alabama's probably going to be loaded for that matchup. I think on LSU, the one thing I, I think we probably should appreciate about Brian Kelly a little bit more is I think the stability that LSU hasn't had will be there under him. Like Edwards run and Les Miles, it was always a year-to-year -year roller coaster. It will not be that way under Brian Kelly. This roster is a roster that can be a playoff team next year. They're going to get Mason Smith back. Harold Perkins is going to be even better next year. And if it's not Jaden Daniels, Garrett Nussmeyer's look pretty good at times too. And a young offensive line is going to be better. So I, I think they're they're neck and neck. In the national rankings, I'd probably have them back to back. And they're certainly two or two and three in my power rankings. I, 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 that I, is I, a really good point too, because Brian Bill, I mean, Brian Kelly just pulls out a lot of the volatility that we've seen within the true. program on and off the field. And you know, you watch LSU and it, those things mirror each other. If things are chaos on the field, oftentimes there's stuff happening off the field that shouldn't be and vice versa. And that's why Brian Kelly was a good hire because they've always had talent. It's just, can you wrangle it? And you do you have the discipline to ke like keep it moving and the momentum going in your direction? I love how Steven used the phrase like give, give Nick Saban a couple of months to prepare for LSU. Like the first nine games of the season aren't going to be a factor for, for Alabama. He's like, no, he's, got, he's, got, he's got seven months to prepare for Brian Kelly's offense. <laughs> he's, he's getting ready for it. Um, listen, I, I think LSU and Bama is going to be a fun debate. I think we're going to get to SEC media days and it's going to be a really fun debate. I think a lot of people are going to err on the side of sort of knowledge and stability and kind of caution and go with Bama. I, I don't think LSU is crazy, Michael. I don't think it's crazy to pick them at all. I, I, I think you're banking on some things having to happen, and uh, those are certainly possible with Brian Kelly leading the way. Uh, I've got LSU at three. I know Athlon Sports, Stephen, I don't want to speak for you, but you we've got LSU at three. So we obviously, uh, Stephen, you and I are pretty close with, with Michael in terms of where we like LSU relative to Alabama and Georgia. Absolutely. Yeah. I think in the, in my national rankings, they're five and seven, they could be five and six. And frankly, they, one could be four and five. I mean, there's not much separating these two teams. I, I think this debate and then the debate at kind of the bottom of the sec West is probably going to be two of the more extended discussions that we have throughout the off season. But I, I don't think it's crazy to pick LSU at this point to see how Alabama progresses. Also don't think it's crazy to think that 
Alabama's it's Alabama. They're going to figure this out by uh, next October. Aaron, you at number three have Tennessee. Michael, you have Tennessee at number three. Aaron, we'll start with you. I I, I am <laughs> far lower on Tennessee than probably all three of you. So I well, will eventually I will eventually defend myself. But you've I'm going to admit three. something. I did this a little bit for interest and intrigue just what? so that we didn't have the exact same I don't want to have the exact same top three as both of you I did it for a little bit of a shock factor I really do th this is a hard one for me and I think that with LSU you're going on what you've seen and it's a much easier sell and buy that they belong in that spot but I think Tennessee's intangibles that we talked a lot about last season of you know their belief that they could do things when not a, a lot of other people saw it what they were able to do against Alabama and just the culture that Josh Heupel has built there I do think it puts them in contention um, but I, I still under I still understand why you guys have LSU at number three. Michael. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, why do I got Tennessee three? I mean, ahead of got, Alabama. Of course, they just didn't they just whoop Alabama? Aren't they going to do it again? No, they, they did they got, not just whoop Alabama. <laughs> they got Joe Milton. He's going to win the Heisman. You know what I mean? I know you're you a big Joe Milton golly. fan. This is a hey, Tennessee. How can you debate what Josh Heupel has done? I mean, there was people, reputable people, when he got hired, said this is going to be five years before they make a bowl game. They won a New Year's Six bowl game with their defense, mind you, over Clemson uh, in the last game we saw. I think the defense is not the train wreck people assume it is. It was against South Carolina, but that, that was essentially – uh, the, the major blemish they had on the season. The the defense won them the pit game. It won them the LSU game. Again, it played well in that Orange Bowl. Uh, I think the defense is, is a lot better than people give it credit for. It's more deeper. It's got more talent. That's where they're really killing it in recruiting the last two years is bringing in all kinds of uh, pass rushers that I think is really going to start to show itself next season. And Josh Heupel, my friend uh, Adam McClintock, he's part of Matrix Analytical. They do hirings for well they don't do hiring they make they make recommended hiring so this is not some guy with a website or anything he's got josh heupel as the second best play caller in the country and i don't think there's any debate about that i mean hen and hooker is awesome i don't want to diminish anything he did but who the hell was he before he got to tennessee i mean he he couldn't you know he lost a job at virginia tech and this was a, a bad virginia tech um if, if it's not joe milton i don't know if you guys saw this today Take this for what it's worth. Uh -oh, uh oh, oh, wait a second. Are we going? Are we going Cruton rankings here? Yeah, let's go, all, let's go Cruton rankings, baby. On three sports, <laughs> just said Nico, their five-star freshman is the number one prospect, not the number one quarterback, number one prospect in the country. So, I don't know. I mean, if again, if it's not Joe Milton, I think they're going to be fine with Nico. Um, probably not going to be as good as they were last year, but I mean, they were just so dynamic on offense with Josh Heupel. I, I think they're going to be in every game they they play, including Georgia, which has to come to Knoxville this season. Uh, Steven, did all those defensive five stars uh, matter for Texas A&M this year? They didn't, especially when no, it came to stopping no, the run. Uh, you know, obviously A&M had a lot of issues on, on both sides mess. of the ball. But yeah, <laughs> I think, you know, I think a lot of things that Mike said there are true. Like I, I just trust Tennessee to reload on offense. Maybe it's not, one of the best in, in college football at number one or number two in scoring offense. But I think it'll be somewhere in the top 10 to 15. Once again, I think defensively, you know, they are going to require a lot of those guys to kind of grow up on the job. When you look yep. at the scoring defense from last season, they cut their scoring defense total about a touchdown. They were also much improved against the run. Uh, Byron Young is gone. The secondary struggle, like those are two areas that I'm going to be watching for Tennessee. They have some tricky road trips. You know, they have to go to Florida early in the year. They have to go to Kentucky, have to play at Alabama. So I think if you're, if you're a Tennessee fan, you're really optimistic about the offense, despite the yeah. losses and how the defense comes together, probably determines whether this is an 11 and one team or closer to nine and three. Well, that's so, something LSU and Tennessee both have in common a little bit, like you mentioned, is just that need to kind of fill fill things in on defense and make sure that they're working properly um, and make sure that everything is clean. And then, you know, but for LSU, I do think the advantage, if there is one trying to put one team above the other, is the um, 
two all two Jane all Americans Daniels. two all well, Americans in, in the front seven that Tennessee yeah they're doesn't the have? whole like, they're all like <laughs> they're all all five of their you know starting offensive linemen I think is yeah that's know, another one we talk about that being at the core of the stability of a team is the you know the offensive line working together well and it's something that you can't rush and so to go into the season with that I think it's a huge advantage for them. I am glad that I'm very clear, not very clearly not reputable because uh, I did. I had I had Tennessee making bowl games. I did not see the upside that Josh Heupel has already delivered. Like, there's no question that I did not see that. I thought they'd be pretty good. Eight and four, nine and three pretty consistently. Um, But he's got to restock now. I I think the key with both LSU and Tennessee is when you don't have rosters built of top five classes, like three or four, five, six years in a row, like they have at some other places. When you lose your elite guys, I think that hurts those types of teams more. I think if Tennessee is eight and four this year, that's actually a huge compliment to Josh Heupel. Like if they go nine and three this year and they lose to Bama and Georgia, let's say hypothetically, and one other time, I would argue that's a huge compliment to Josh Heupel and the job he's done because those classes haven't gotten into the depth chart fully yet. And that's where I I thought Ole Miss at eight and five this year was a hell of a season because of all the stuff that they lost the year before. That was sort of historically good, and I feel like Tennessee's kind of in a similar situation. But there's no doubting that the job Josh Heupel has done uh, on campus with with Tennessee. There's there's no there's no question you can you doubt that. I do think LSU is a deeper team on defense in particular, and and has their returning starting quarterbacks. So that that would probably be my the reason I've got LSU. Yeah. Um, you've got Bama, Michael at four. You've kind of already explained a little bit why you feel that way. I guess my question for you is with Bama, and this is for everybody because I've got Tennessee at four. Steven, you've got who do you have at four? Tennessee. Tennessee Athlon Sports officially. Tennessee at four. And then Aaron, you've got LSU. So we have the same top four. How how low is the lowest team of this group, if that makes sense? Like how low down the national rankings, uh, Michael, do you have Alabama? Probably six or seven. I mean, I'm pretty biased to SEC, so <laughs> throw them all in the top ten. You know what? I think I think the rest of the country sucks. <laughs> and we saw that in the playoff. All I had to hear about was Michigan. Oh, my God, this Michigan team is so good. Well, they've embarrassed themselves twice. Ohio State, <laughs> I, I give them, they they played well. We, th- we can, Ohio State is a legit team, but the rest of them, now nah, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Steven? <laughs> I, I think they're all top 10 teams right now. Um, you and I kind of, dis- I think, disagreed a little bit on where Tennessee is, Braden. But I think right now, I think what we're – it's it's hard. Like, are you projecting ahead, or are you just kind of taking a snapshot of these teams going into the spring? And I think t- going into the spring, I would put Tennessee in the top ten just based upon what happened last year. I don't think they're far behind some of these LSU or Alabama at this point. Aaron, how far down the list you got LSU outside the top ten at number four in the SEC? Uh, that's hard. When you think I'm the that. only one here. I'm the only one here that has like Tennessee at like fifteen or sixteen. So um, I. I- I think they're good. I just don't think they're top 10 good. That's all. Yeah, I, I Take think down LSU, your diploma. I think <laughs> it's hard. It's hard because they're hanging I mean, in here somewhere. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think you'd right on right on the border, if not in the top 10. I think you could put all four of those up there. And I'm not quite as biased uh, outwardly as Michael is. But um, yeah, there's a I could I could see them all four being in there. I, and I absolutely could see Tennessee eventually being in there. I just don't think they deserve even if to start it's not to now. start there. Yeah, yeah even if they that. don't start there. Um, all right, so here, we're going to pause here because this is where we're going to have lots of disagreements because this is where it gets real fucking crazy uh, in the SEC because there's a lot of different opinions about a lot of different teams. So let's go down to the very bottom where we all agree. Aaron, who do you have at number 14 in the SEC right now? Um, well, my alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> I, You know... I like what Clark Lee is doing. It just takes time. And Vanderbilt was very behind in a lot of ways with facilities. And if they're going to stay out of that very bottom tier of the SEC, if not the bottom, then next time we do a $300 million renovation, it needs to be earlier when other people are, you know, so we're not behind for a decade by the time we spend the money. And then by the time it's done, Everybody has made another $70 million renovation and then we're back where we were. So yeah. maybe just put your foot on the gas, Vandy, a little bit when it comes to facilities and just help this program out. But I, I do trust what Clark Lee's doing. It just takes time, which people in the SEC and college football fans all over everywhere are not patient when it comes to their team um, needing to rebuild. Nobody has any other thoughts on Vanderbilt Commodores. 
I, let me tell you. Also, you have to be able like, to. You also have to be able to read to get in. Just let me add that. Oh <laughs> man! Clear, clearly, they no, they would not even have read my letter that I wrote them. You know what I mean? But um, man, I I get tired of defending Vanderbilt because I think Vanderbilt's got potential. Not to be a juggernaut by any means, but there's no reason they can't be Northwestern or Wake Forest or some rendition of that. Um, I continue to hear troubling things, Braden. Like. I don't know if you guys have heard this, and this may not be 100% true, but is as it was relayed to me, uh, a guy like Ray Davis didn't even want to leave. I think for whatever reason, he couldn't get into the grad school program. And this is far and away your best running back, arguably your best offensive weapon, and now he's playing for Kentucky. I mean, imagine, again, I know Vanderbilt's not Alabama, but imagine Bryce Young needed a some kind of – <laughs> waiver or whatever to get into grad school my god i mean that phone call would have yeah, taken 30 yeah. seconds he'd be in there I know. When, you, when you hear stuff like that what the hell are we doing here i mean clark lee we're t- we're tying both hands behind his back uh mike wright i hated seeing him go into the transfer portal i think there's a there's a chance he does come back though and, and i realize he may not be your best option but he's kind of like the heart and soul of that team they don't win those two sec games without mike wright yeah. so I don't know when they take two steps forward it's like they're taking one step back so i kind of have to put vanderbilt at 14 but they're a hell of a lot better than today than they were when they hired clark lee and i think that's how you got to judge them right now and yeah. and way better if we would have had this conversation at the same time last year there's no question about that i for sure there, there's some there's some nil background here you probably need to know they only got their collective up and running like a couple of months ago and largely the best players that have come back or will come back to the team are because they clearly got them NIL deals to come back. And it's obviously working a lot better for the Vandy baseball program than and actually non-revenue sports for Vanderbilt. So they got to figure that out. I, I mean, I agree with, with both you guys, Aaron and Michael, and I think Steven's probably going to, you're shaking your head too. Like I, there could be there could be a lot more with this program than there is. And the administration a lot of times is to be blamed, not necessarily the coaching staff or the players couple of thoughts on Vanderbilt looking ahead to this year. I, I think it's – you can just look at the win total and see they were a better team. I mean, they came one win away from making a bowl game, and I think there are some reasons to be optimistic. I, I think you're starting to see some of the players they recruited starting to step in. I like the potential of A.J. Swan and Mike Wright, however that works out at quarterback. But Clark Lee's side of the ball is defense, and they finished last in the SEC – each of the last two years on defense, that side of the ball needs to take a big step forward. But I think the, the larger conversation is Vanderbilt was really far behind, but I think in terms of the on-field product, this coaching staff is catching them up to the pack. It's going to take a little bit more to pass some of these teams in the East, but at least they're way more competitive and they should be better next season, um, especially if they can continue to improve on defense. We all agree exactly on the exact same team for number 13. We obviously have a huge discussion for between 5 and 12. We'll get into all of that. Uh, before we do, though, however, Fringe Element, Aaron Dugan, is brought to you by our wonderful and amazing friends and folks at? Jay Dunn. They are not ranked 14th out of 14th in their respective category. They are ranked number one in best place to work and um, are clearly doing something better than where I chose to go to college. They they will make they will make that phone call to make sure their star running back gets that graduate acceptance letter. They will J. E. Dunn will do that for you, but like not in like a cheaty, dirty kind of way. Like in like a normal, just above board, take care of your employees to make sure they're fulfilled and happy. Kind and of he- way. and healthy and productive kind of way. Right. Right. A lot of adjectives in that sentence. <laughs> do we do we think Alabama is trying to make um, Bill O'Brien happy or trying to find a way to <laughs> politely escort him off the campus? <laughs> I, I, I've never seen a fan base more excited to lose two coaches <laughs> right, <laughs> than Alabama. Uh, and uh, the problem is, is they're not going to need to go to J.E. Dunn because some a bunch of idiots are going to give those two guys a bunch of cash. I guess one of them slain Kiffin. <laughs> so I guess we'll, I guess we'll get to that in a second, but uh, jdunn.com is the website. Uh, just go click on the tab right there at the top. Just click on careers. You can check out all the job offerings that are open. There's offer. You don't need any background. Everywhere. You can yes. literally move wherever you want to basically in the country, and anywhere that doesn't suck. Anywhere. They have an <laughs> office. J.E. Dunn, they'll get you a graduate degree and they, you can, they'll move you anywhere that doesn't suck. Go to jedunn.com and <laughs> look for careers. I mean, these aren't, yeah, you know what I mean? It's not like offices in the middle of like, Topeka? You know, yeah, it's not like a Texarkana headquarters. It's wow. like wow. Charleston. 
Get my the family from there. I always pick places where my family lives because I feel like it's more justified. That's the home of LaMichael James. Is that right? LaMichael James, a former Oregon running back from he's Texarkana. From Texarkana. Like. Yeah. Some people don't even know that exists. Is he the guy who moved across the border to get into like a better high school so that the high school could get him into Oregon or something? There was somebody that, like, I didn't. I don't know this story. Texarkana is in Texas, by the way, just so everybody knows. <laughs> it's not it's not in Arkansas. Isn't uh, there also part of it in Arkansas? I don't know. Where's Kansas City, boys and girls? Does anybody know? Missouri. <laughs> exactly. One of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. J J <laughs> Jdun.com is the website. You sound dumb. <laughs> mercifully, mercifully go to the website and just click on careers and look what they've got. I promise you, you will find something. You don't need any background in construction. They will take care of you because they're just a bunch of awesome people. They're just a bunch of awesome people that'll get you a really good job and they'll make sure you're happy when you do it. So just go check them out. Jdun.com. All right, let's get to the rest of the SEC. And apparently I've already made a, a huge mistake because look, life comes at you fast in the SEC. Things move quickly. That SEC speed will get you every time. And we don't all agree on who is 13th. Michael, you have a different team than the rest of us. So why don't you lead us off here? 13th in the SEC. Yeah, so initially I did have Missouri 13. I put this out immediately after, uh, I think it was the night of the national championship game. But things change quickly, as Braden says. I give Florida all the way down at 13, Whoa! changes at Missouri, failing to sign a top quarterback at Florida. I mean, I I don't think it's crazy. I don't think that he should be on the hot seat or anything, but what happens if, uh, if we win five, six games at Florida? I don't think they'd fire Billy Napier, but I mean, last year was just a complete waste. I mean, it, it's been said many times it's a year zero, and I think that's fair. Next season, they open. You know, I don't want to make this too much about the schedule, but they open at Utah. They only get three SEC games at home. This could be a hell of a difficult year for the Florida Gators. And uh, if, if what's his name, Graham Mertz, if that's our starting quarterback, I got real concerns about the Florida Gators this year. I do too. Uh, I think, you know, I've got, I've got Florida one spot ahead of Missouri in my power rankings, but I think as Mike said there, there's a lot of concerns about this team. If you look at last year's roster and start thinking ahead, like the best players are all gone. I mean, it's Osiris Torrance, Anthony Richardson, you know, Ricky Pearsall did decide to come back. They've got a nice stable of running backs too, but defensively, it's going to be a lot of new faces off a of defense that wasn't very good last year. And as Mike mentioned on the schedule, it's not only Utah, it's playing Florida State, it's getting Arkansas and LSU in crossover. So I think while a lot of problems that Billy Napier inherited couldn't be fixed right away, I think it's going to be important at some point to show some progress. Otherwise, you end up with a situation of it's very hard to sell what's going on in the field and you're turning your potential uh, into just five and seven seasons. And eventually it's just going to, that promise and hope is going to run out. So I, I know Steven, you, you, me and Aaron, we all have Missouri at 13. It, Michael, is it just like, it's not the Jaden Rashada saga. I mean, first of all, it's fantastic to watch. Like it's just a, a ridiculous thing to watch. Like the dad's getting paid by one person and the player's getting paid by another person. And we don't know if either one of them is Florida or Miami. We're not really sure. Uh, he's not enrolled in classes as of time of taping, but like that could change. Is it just, it's not just that one piece, right? Like, is there more to it than just that for you, Michael? Well, for me, it's, it's also Missouri hiring Kirby Moore, who's a top uh, 35. Again, I reference Adam McClintock, CFB professor. You look at his adjusted for roster talent, offensive play callers, uh, Kirby Moore from Fresno state was, I believe top 35. Like I just said, that was one of the biggest issues for Missouri last season drink supposed to be this offensive mastermind the offense just never got going and it's been that way for a while so I think he's hired a very credible play caller and they keep getting guys on the defensive side of the ball which is clearly the stronger side to commit to returning that I thought on January 9th would be off to the NFL so um, Tyron Hopper their their best linebackers back their entire secondary they've added some pieces via the transfer portal I think Missouri's defense is going to be really really good the big question mark, obviously, is the quarterback position. Brady Cook's out for the spring. Sam Horn, this is going to be his opportunity to potentially uh, you know, grab the momentum there. If Sam Horn, who Josh Heupel wanted at Tennessee, if he's the real deal going into his redshirt freshman season, Missouri possibly a, a much more dangerous team than we're giving them credit for. 
when you look at both of these, you know, teams too, and you're looking at Florida's schedule and Missouri, I mean, they're both as, as they often are in the SEC, extremely difficult. And there's not even a ton of breathing room, even in their non-con games, because you've got Florida, hold on, I'm pulling it up right now. Florida has Utah, yeah. Utah, right to start the season. And then their other, and then, you know, they always play Florida State, which is, you know, different year to year. They get to breathe against Charlotte at the beginning of the season and McNeese State. And that's basically, well, and I guess Vanderbilt. Um, but although Vanderbilt had some surprises up their sleeve this year, um, maybe that's possible. I don't think it's yeah. likely. But Missouri also has some tough, you know, crossover too. And can't, or sorry, not crossover, non con in Kansas State. And then they're, are they playing Memphis? Yeah, so Memphis that's and not, St. Louis. Yeah. it's not a super easy, you know, non-con game either. So not that any SEC schedules really have a lot of breathing room, but sometimes you get a little bit more non-con um, than either of these two teams are because those are two, two pretty good non-con opponents on. Well, am I, I, it was very late at night when I looked this up, Florida's crossovers are LSU and Arkansas, Arkansas. Okay. So Missouri's got Arkansas as well. I just like. That could be two really tough games for Florida. I do think, yeah. again, I've I've got Florida at 12. Athlon Sports has Florida at 12. Aaron, you've got Florida at 12. So we're, we're kind of all debating Missouri versus Florida here in these two slots. And I, I don't think Napier – I think, Michael, you make a great point about why you're concerned about Florida, and I agree with everything. I don't think they're that close to – I think they – I think they needed to let Napier do a lot more work than maybe even Florida fans wanted to admit when they hired him to some yeah. degree. And I like all the stuff that you've decided about Missouri. Here's the, the thing that's interesting about this is that the bottom three in this conference are all in the East. So that could help teams like Tennessee or potentially Kentucky or Georgia. But it also is it also could mean that we have 13 bowl eligible teams. Is that out of the question that that 13 of these teams could make to get to six wins? Or is that is the math not work out at that point? <laughs> I say put I, them all in. <laughs> I think I think something that we're we're kind of hitting on with both Florida and Missouri. I think Missouri's offensive line is a big question. I think Missouri's defense might be the best position group out of these four teams. I think if you study like Florida, Missouri, the biggest question is quarterback play. Like which one of these teams is going to get better quarterback play? And certainly with Florida's revamped offensive line, like th this discussion might come down the summer to which team solves qu quarterback and offensive line better. I do think Graham Mertz is better than he thinks Missouri has. And I do think Napier has shown a a, a better track record of developing that position. But that, again, these, we're, we're splitting hairs here on two of what could be the worst teams in the league, which also could be bowl teams. So, uh, all right, let's go back to five here, uh, everybody, because we have four people on this show with four different opinions at who is number five. Steven, we'll start with you. Who is the fifth best team in the SEC right now today? Not a ton of confidence, but I've got Ole Miss at five. Um, I, I like the the potential for this offense. Again, uh, of course, we saw what Lane Kiffin did last year with all those new pieces, assembling one of the SEC's best offenses. Quinshaw Judkins is back. Jackson Dart is back for a second year. Maybe they have an addition uh, that could maybe push him. Also, like the receivers that they brought in from the transfer portal. I think Pete Golding is also an upgrade on defense, too, for Ole Miss. May not have been great. Enough to work out at Alabama, but I think he'll upgrade Ole Miss defensively. Honestly, you could talk me into a couple teams here. I kind of just went with Ole Miss because I like their offense at this point. I think five through ten, you could my on my list anyway, is interchangeable. But I got South Carolina there, and a lot of this has to do with Rattler coming back, uh, Juice Wells coming back, who I think's got the potential to be the best receiver in the SEC. If he continues to progress, my concern, though, for South Carolina, the line of scrimmage, I don't know that that's going to be a strength. It certainly wasn't at times this past season, and they just lost their best defensive lineman to Oregon, I believe, transfer portal Jordan Birch. So some question marks, but South Carolina, I mean, they're, they're like a damn roller coaster with the highs and lows. If we can take out the lows, which I may be asking a lot, but uh, I, I do like the culture there. I know that's that's kind of cheesy, and I know Mark Stoops has made fun of that. But uh, aside from the fan base, which at, at times I think can get to Shane Beamer, I love the culture. He, you don't see guys like Luke Doty jumping into the portal. You don't see the carry on joiner who, you know, maybe he wants to be a quarterback, maybe not suited to be a receiver. These guys stick it out because – for whatever reason, I think the culture is very, very strong in Columbia. If they continue to make strides, 
we're talking potentially a nine, 10 win team next season. Yeah. For me, um, talking about that, you know, that fifth spot, I have Arkansas there. Um, and part of that, everyone knows how I feel about, you know, the coaching staff at Arkansas. And I've been just waiting for this to kind of fully come to fruition for them for the past couple of years, because I think they have the right pieces in place. I mean, I, they did have losses obviously up and down their roster in the past couple of years, but the coaching staff and the consistency is there, unlike it has been for a lot of other programs in this conference. And I'm just kind of waiting for it to hit. I'm hoping it's this year, but I will say that it's not going to be easy if they do come out at number five because they have, they don't have their home games. They've got some must win ones and they have to, they'd have to win, you know, three out of, they play BYU, Mississippi State, Auburn, and Missouri. And I think even to get to bowl eligibility, they'd have to win three of those. Yeah. Um, so it would be a, if they do it, it won't be easy, but I do think that at some point this Arkansas system is going to work. I just don't know exactly when, but I'm taking a gamble and saying it might be this year. I think those are all perfectly wonderful and amazing, smart, logical cases for those three teams. <laughs> like, totally agree. Uh, except for I'm going to go with Kentucky at number five. Okay. <laughs> um, and again, for kind of almost all. Now, if you look at the schedule, just avert your eyes if you're a Kentucky fan. Just don't don't look at what you have to play on the schedule because that's not. I'm, this is more of like a power ranking in January, not a where do I think they could finish potentially. Uh, I think the offense is going to be really really good because Liam Cohen is that much better. I, I think Devin Leary is okay. I think he's solid. I think he's a great replacement if you're replacing a guy that people believe is as good as Will Levis. Maybe could possibly be at some point in the future. I don't know. Uh, I I'm, I'm buying into like sort of program stability as well. The defense is going to be really good. They've recruited really well on the front seven. Those guys are all coming back. The weaponry on offense around Devin Leary and the new coordinator, Liam Cohen, I think is really, really solid. So I agree with Michael though, that basically five through 10, I can even include 11 and say, these are all, you know, seven and five, nine and three, they're all going to be within seven and nine wins. And I think Kentucky, you know, they probably beat South Carolina last year if they have Levis. I think they were better than Ole Miss. They got hosed on a couple of bad calls at the end of that game. If that's a bad year for Kentucky, I think we're kind of – I think they're going to be undervalued by sort of the group think because they don't have the star power necessarily as some of these other, other teams do. Uh, South Carolina is fascinating to me. Like, I, you can't really explain what they're doing. Like, you can't, like, you, like you can't explain – it's Beamer ball mixed with, like, Sam Pittman – you know, just being an old guy, like just like like come play for me, guys, and like injecting some life into the program, and then they're beating teams that they're not supposed to. Spencer Rattler finally figures it out at the end of the year. Like I, I don't know what to make of South Carolina. Um, it's tough. But I've I've got Kentucky at four. So Stephen Stephen goes with Ole Miss. Michael goes with South Carolina. Aaron goes with Arkansas, and I go with Kentucky. Who we got next? Michael, we'll I've start got, with you. I got I've Kentucky got right there for every for everything you just said, and I think. Hell, Mark Stoops is getting paid nearly $9 million. If we cannot finish in the top half of the SEC, we may have to get his ass out of here. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, I, I have to imagine all offseason, they're just going to be motivated. I mean, this is this is a, obviously a developmental program. Yes. Uh, they've, they've lost a couple guys via the transfer portal, but they've obviously gained. I think what they've gained, they're, I'm going to be talking about the biggest winners from the transfer portal when it closes uh, on Wednesday. I think Kentucky is going to be right up there. So um, the offensive line, though, is, is a big, big question yeah. mark. They've added pieces there. If that doesn't gel together, none of it's going to work. If it does gel together, they may be the most improved unit in all of the SEC. So I like Kentucky right there at six. I've got Arkansas at six. Um, I, I actually, like Mike said earlier, I don't think it, there's a, not a whole lot separating any of these teams. I, I like what Kentucky's done in the portal. I am concerned about their offensive line. The thing I like about Arkansas is they return two of the SEC's best players, and that's Rocket Sanders and KJ Jefferson. I think where Arkansas season will make a break will be on defense. New defensive coordinator, Travis Williams, comes over from UCF. He's been a player and a coach uh, elsewhere in the SEC. And they brought in some guys to the portal, but this was a defense that I think kind of underachieved. And you also look at some of the guys they've lost. They've taken some hits on this side of the ball. I don't think scoring points should not be a problem for Arkansas. It's the other side of the ball yeah. uh, that I have concerns about. So there could be a lot of 48 to 45 type games next year in Fayetteville. I, I've got Arkansas at six as well for all the reasons you just laid out. I think they're like a slightly better version of Ole Miss. Like, 
like different defensive coordinator, great quarterback, great running back. Like they're not all that different. Those two programs, yeah. it, it literally how they're built this year. I kind of lean Arkansas over Ole Miss right now. Uh, although Aaron, I know you like the rebels. Well, I had, I mean, I had Arkansas, bef- I had Arkansas in the five spot and then rebels. Right. So continue. Did to you talk say that about- backwards? No, I, I just was saying you like the rebels next. Sorry. I <laughs> oh, one, okay. I okay. Okay. I was word. like, wait, um, yes, I think I'm, I'm on the same page as y'all with most everything that was just said. And then also, if I don't know where to look with a team, um, I, I do tend to, which really applies more for uh, maybe Ole Miss over some other teams coming up that are a little bit further down my list. But it's just the stability of the offensive line. And I sound like a broken record, but it's just so important and something that cannot be taught that quickly. It just has to kind of work out and figure itself out. And they have four of five, um, they're returning offensive, li- starting offensive linemen. And, um, you know, they kind of got a taste of what it feels like to get come out of the gate hot last year. They just couldn't finish it off. Yeah. And then they come out when like seven straight games or something. So I think that if they they had got that feeling now they have the like the stability of Lane Kiffin and knowing that he's not going anywhere and I think it's just up from here for the Rebels. I know Aaron, you've got Kentucky next. I know obviously Michael and I are very high on them, so uh, you've got Kentucky at seven. So you not too different in terms of where we evaluate the Wildcats there. Uh, let's talk Mississippi State here for a second because Aaron, you've got them at eight. I've got them at seven. Mm-hmm. You've got them next, Michael, at seven as well. I am having oh, an ap- wait. I apologize. Oh, it's been changed. It's been changed. I'm calling another audible. Audible, for two reasons. Omaha, <laughs> Bobby Petrino. Come oh. on down. <laughs> I. It's so hard to. We'll get to a in a second. But but Mississippi State. It's so impossible to me to evaluate because I think like if 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 I could combine Ole Miss and Mississippi State and take like the coaching staff from Ole Miss and put it on Mississippi State, I feel like Mississippi State would be a great team. But like I just. I don't know about Arnett. I don't know about the. They're losing some pieces on the on the defense. I I don't know, Stephen. You, what do we what do we think about Mississippi State here, boys and girls? Pro- probably the hardest team to rank. I, I think obviously the coaching transition. I think Zach Arnett's putting his his kind of stamp on the program with by hiring Kevin Barbe as offensive coordinator. I mean, he's going away from the air raid, probably trying to get a little little bit more balance. I think the good thing is is that Barbe's offenses, whether it's at C- CMU or App State, have been very productive. Um, but it is a change, and I think just that unknown with all the transition kind of pushed Mississippi State down my list. I like the fact Will Rogers is back. You mentioned the defense. Some of those guys um, who were could be seniors decide to come back for next season. I am concerned about losing uh, Forbes in the secondary because he was so good the last couple of years. So I I think Mississippi State, if we we can get a better idea on some of this transition, what does the offense look like? You could easily put them a little bit higher. But I think just unknown, uh, Zach Arnett being a first-time coach to the SEC. So, Michael, you are first with Texas A&M. So you've got A&M now at seven. Um, they're lower on all of our lists. So I, listen, I know the reasons why you're buying in. I, I probably agree with all of them. I, I, I have too much PTSD with the Aggies. Like I just, it's, <laughs> it's too many years. It's too many years of this back big 12 sec. Doesn't matter what conference. Uh, and <laughs> I've, I've done all the LSU's job to be this unpredictable. I know, That's what I know. It, Texas A&M feels like me trying to predict what LSU is going to be like for the past couple of years. And I'm just like, I don't know. Yeah, and I, I think everybody that's hyping up the Aggies this offseason, they're going to conveniently forget that the defense, particularly the run defense, went off a damn cliff last season. So that that is going to be something they're going to have to adjust. They've got all the talent in the world. They've got uh, uh, you know one of the, the, the most overhyped head coaches in college football history. I'm trying not to be negative. Every time I bring up Jimbo, I'm negative. I apologize. But hiring Bobby Petrino, I think, takes away – all the extra stuff on Jimbo's plate that he doesn't do well. And I think it also at the same time takes away from Bobby Petrino's responsibilities, all the many things like running a program that he cannot do effectively. All he's got to do is call plays, develop these quarterbacks. And if he's just got to do that, I think potential there, he could be a grand slam for Texas A&M. It's the inmates running the asylum for how long will it last? (laughs) It, this is a very volatile team for next year. I think the, you know, we've touched on this a little bit, but when you look at anything after four in these power rankings, like you could make an argument for AM 
to be the fifth best team in here. Um, they, they just, I think you could put it, you see him some in some early top 25s. Nothing would surprise me about this team. It could implode and they could finish four and eight, or they could rebound and finish eight and four. I honestly like they're, they're right behind Mississippi State as one of the hardest teams to figure out. I, I think defensively, you have to be a lot better up front. You look at their secondary too, they're very thin at the corner spots. I like Connor Wigman, Evan Stewart. We assume I think Ruben Owens will take over the number one running back spot. There's a lot to like there, but I also think that there's still some questions, especially along the offensive line. It was a group that massively underachieved, had some injuries, still skeptical of Steve Adazio being the right assistant. So they have the talent to finish top 25, but they also have the volatility to implode and finish uh, 13th on this list too. Well, and so, just the, I don't know if this is as, as concerning for everybody else as it was for me. And I think Jimbo Fisher is highly entertaining, but things do trickle down from the top. And I did feel like there was a lack of accountability from the coaching staff specifically Jimbo in terms of what was should fall on him and what a lot of coaches would have taken the hit for he did not I know some of that had to do with you know and then different coordinators were let go whatever but I I don't think Braden and I talk a lot about how I you know I I'm a big press conference geek I read into the intangibles a lot and not taking accountability is not a great vibe to trickle down to the over a hundred guys on your roster that need to take accountability for their position on the team. Um, so I just don't love that. And for that reason, I just could not put them any higher. So, all right, we'll re recap this real quickly here. Michael Braden, you have South Carolina five, Kentucky six, Texas A&M seven, Mississippi state eight, Arkansas. Nope. No, no. Okay. All right. Well, hang on then. Hang on then. Ole Miss five. Steven, you have Ole Miss five, Arkansas six, South Carolina 7, Kentucky 8, Mississippi State 9, Texas A&M 10. I go Kentucky, Arkansas, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, South Carolina. And um, Aaron, you go Arkansas, Ole Miss, Kentucky, Mississippi State, South Carolina, A&M. If that's confusing listening to it, just imagine trying to read it. Um, Steven, you are <laughs> higher on South Carolina than the two of us. Michael, you've already kind of given us your South Carolina spiel. So, Steven, I, I know you've got South Carolina in the top 25 for Athlon Sports, athlonsports.com. Um, give us your thoughts on why you like South Carolina ahead of Kentucky, Mississippi State, A and M. Don't feel great about it, honestly. Um, way I know to sell it, buddy. It's a great way to sell it, but <laughs> I think to start, I think it's exactly what Mike said earlier. Was I? I, I like the the return of Spencer Rattler and Juice Wells. Um, I also think that you know I've doubted South Carolina a little bit the last two years, and they've just exceeded my expectations. So right now, as we sit and we haven't hit spring practice, I have them in my top twenty-five. Once we dissect this team a little bit more. Maybe they move down. I love the special teams element, too. I think Pete Limbo is one of the best, if not the best, special teams coach in college football. I have concerns on the offensive line, and I still have no idea what to make of the Dow Loggins hire. It seems very curious to me for, for many reasons. Yeah, that one's, a, that one's a weird one. All right, Michael, correct me again for the third time on the show. Yeah, so I, I like Ole Miss now, number eight. I, right. I just I love the move of Pete Golding. I think that's a major upgrade for Ole Miss. And the names I keep hearing of, of the staff that he can potentially build up there, they're basically getting former Alabama assistants known for recruiting and their defensive, uh, you know, you know, learning from Nick Saban, obviously. So I think the defensive staff now will be significantly improved in Oxford. And it sound, I don't think it's official yet, unless we just missed it here while we were recording, but it sounds like Walker Howard, the former LSU five-star freshman in the transfer portal, likely to go to Ole Miss. And I love that too, because I'm not completely sold on Jackson Dart. I saw enough of him to think that he's a good player, but I think you bring in a guy like Walker Howard because at, at LSU, where they got two capable quarterbacks, he had no chance of, of stealing any snaps. At Ole Miss, I, I assure they're not telling him, hey, you come in here, you'll start because we got Jackson Dart. But if you outperform him, we will go with you. And I got more uh, faith in, in Lane Kiffin than just about anybody to coach up a quarterback. So if we're adding to the quarterback room or fixing the defense a little bit, I think Ole Miss got some serious potential next season. I, I've got Ole Miss at eight as well. The reason I would have Arkansas ahead, though, is because because of Dart. I actually think K.J. Jefferson is more dependable. While the injuries might be a problem, I think Jackson Dart's inaccuracy and sometimes like his athletic ability is off the charts, and when it's good, it looks real nice. But 
I think KJ Jefferson is a little bit more dependable uh, as far as those two teams, again, I think being built virtually identically. Um, Aaron, you and I have South Carolina at nine, so we probably need to defend that a little bit. Again, I think some of it's we don't really have a big gap between five and nine, but some of it's I just can't put my finger on how this program has been so good in the last couple of seasons and overachieved so much, and eventually you just have to tip your cap to the guy. Yeah, I mean, it, it, something's working, and we don't necessarily have to understand how or why to know that it is, and it is. Um, there is talk about culture. I mean, I think the most impressive culture changes – I mean, we haven't really, I guess we don't see as much inside the LSU program because that's just not as much Brian Kelly's style as it is Shane Beamer. He lets you in a little bit more and kind of lets you know what's going on. And and um, him and Josh Heupel, to me, were the, the most impressive culture changes on a dime, whether that's because we can see into it more or, you know, whether it's really the case, it's just to be able to turn a program around that quickly. And Shane Beamer is a definition of a chip on his shoulder. And that's what South Carolina needed to have. And it is fun when things are good in Columbia, that fan base, as they have all said for years, they have everything that they need to be great. They just needed somebody to make it work. And all the other things were in place. They weren't facing the same challenges that Vanderbilt had. They have, create like top of the line facilities, um, you know, support from the university. And um, yeah, I, I mean, you, you he's, can win he's heading in a direction and he didn't look like he's slowing down. I, so. I don't think you can win championships with like just doing all the little things right. But I think you could turn a program around by doing all the little things right. And I think that I, how much upside does that give him? I don't know. Um, but I think Shane Beamer was on this show last summer saying the most overrated thing in college football is that you have to be a great play caller to be a good head coach. Uh, and he's showing us right away, you don't need to be a great OC or a DC to be a good head coach. It's a totally different skill set, which leaves us to one program left. <laughs> and I love that we finished on this 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 team because I it is the most interesting man in America, coaching the most interesting program in America uh, that is sure to explode in your face at any moment. Um, the Auburn Tigers, we, we all think they could be better than the worst teams, but not into that same group that we just discussed. So, Stephen, we'll start with you. What do you make of Auburn? I've got him at 11. Aaron's got him at 11. Michael, are you changing, or do we all have him at – you got him at 12, we got him at 11. We're all basically about the same here on Auburn. So, Stephen, we'll, we'll start with you to end the show today. <laughs> I don't think it's crazy to think that they easily exceed number 11. Um, I, I think that they're this – what this – the staff that Hugh Freeze has put together is top-notch. Ron Roberts and Philip Montgomery – should be great play callers. I also like what they're doing in the portal. They've hit the, the line of scrimmage hard on offense, which they really needed to do. Brought in some guys on defense. Really, the biggest question for me is going to be, how does all that transfer new staff mesh? We saw this at some of the places last year. It worked really well. I think quarterback play is probably the one area that Auburn is. That's the one area that gives you a little bit of pause. I saw enough out of Robbie Ashford to think there's some upside to where he could really thrive in next year's system. We'll see if they can bring in anybody from the portal. But I've got them at number 11. I think they will be significantly better. I could easily see them exceeding that if the quarterback play line of scrimmage falls into place. Well, I think their actions in the transfer portal tell you everything you need to know about uh, what they think of Robbie Ashford. I mean, they've tried to get every damn quarterback in the portal to come down there. So uh, <laughs> look for them to upgrade there, no doubt. I love what they've done on the line of scrimmage because I thought both sides – was probably the weakest in the SEC prior to the portal opening. They have they have landed some studs on, on both sides of the line of scrimmage. Uh, they may be the best or most improved team via the portal. Um, and Hugh Freeze, say what you want about him. I'm not a fan of him personally. Uh, but as a, just looking at the X's and O's and, and building the program, I think he could certainly say far more accomplished than Josh Heupel when he got to Tennessee, but not quite as accomplished as Brian Kelly when he got to LSU. But we've seen those two coaches turn their programs around immediately. No reason Hugh Freeze with the staff he's assembled can't do the same. So I wouldn't be stunned at all if they win, I don't know, eight, maybe even nine games might be stretching it, but seven, eight win team mm -hmm. next season. I think that's if, if you're an optimistic Auburn fan, that's what you're hoping for. And just, you know, you pull the stunner of all stunners beating uh, nine and four, nine and three Alabama in the Iron Bowl. Oh, God. I am not 
I am aware of what Hugh Freeze can and probably will be able to do. I am not his <laughs> biggest fan either. Um, but I think this conversation will be very different next year. Uh, honestly, just I, I don't think it's going to take long for him to take a program yep. like that with the reputation and the resources that they have and his reputation as a coach and what he's been able to do to turn that around. I think this conversation is absolutely different. I think they're upper, uh, you know, top of the middle tier of the SEC by the time this time next season or this time in the off season next year. But right now, I just haven't you have we haven't seen it yet. So there's nothing. You know, I can't really do anything with them until I kind of see something happen on the field. And I just don't have, you know, we don't have the knowledge to do that at this point. That's what every fan base, you know, ascribes to be or aspires to be the upper half of the middle tier or whatever. Well, you know what? <laughs> since we just put, since we tier. just put four in the top 10 no, I know, preseason, I know, I know. It's, I know. it's not too bad. What did I, what did I say last year about LSU the entire off season? They are going to be much better, much quicker than anyone thinks. And mm -hmm. I'm going to say that this year about Auburn. They are going to be much better, much quicker than anyone thinks. I don't know how it ends. Can't wait to find out. But they're going to be much better, much quicker than people think. Uh, I, I don't think I need to add anything about what I think of Hugh Freeze, the man, versus Hugh Freeze, the coach. Um, all right, there you have it. So th that's, <laughs> that, those are the power. Those are the power. Can I say right there. one thing on that, though? Uh, the, the fact that, again, you may hate – Hugh Freeze, you may even hate Auburn, not saying anyone does here, but I think him being at Auburn, I think that's good for the SEC in, in one key aspect that's getting overlooked. I don't think it's good Alabama and Georgia's is dominating our sport. And say what you want about that guy, what, however he goes about it, he's going to make Auburn better. And it's going to, it, it, you know, it may not be uppercuts to Georgia and Alabama, but it'll be, you know, gut shots that I think will, take them down slightly uh it's not good that that arguably you know two of the best rivalries in the sec are non-competitive eight nine out of ten times i think it's going to be closer to you know uh, uh 60 40 something like that with hugh freeze at hey, auburn uh, gus malzahn won plenty of those games so i i uh, not gus against wanted... georgia no no i mean against against alabama i the the rivalries have been close games that's all i care about i don't care about the record itself now i will say you would talk about body blows across the SEC. A good Tennessee combined with an LSU, who's, by the way, the defending Western Division champions, Correct. a better Florida, a better Auburn, and an A&M with Bobby P. It's all going to explode soon, <laughs> but it's going to be real competitive across the board in the SEC. So there's our January, mid-January power rankings brought to you by J.E. Dunn, of course, our wonderful and amazing sponsor. Steven, where can people find you? You can follow me on Twitter at Athlon Steven. You can check out all my work at athlonsports.com and check me out on YouTube at all CFB365. All awesome places to get great college football content from every conference, not just the SEC. If you want more SEC, though, Michael, where can people find you? Do I got time to change my list one more time? Nope. No. Just, no. I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just get kidding. Get the hell out of here. That SEC podcast, SEC Mike, just Google either one of those. There you go. Aaron? Um, the Aaron Dugan on Twitter and Aaron underscore Dugan on Instagram. You can get to me on Twitter as well at Braden Gall at 440 Sports, the YouTube page. Rate, review, subscribe, share the product. We do appreciate all your support. Uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. This has been Fringe Element here on the 440 Sports Network. Peace.